Congressman, thanks for being with us. You and your colleagues on the 1-6 Commission met virtually this morning. Did any of this come up on that call? And how interested would you and your colleagues be to discover what Donald Trump brought to Mar-a-Lago and why? We're always interested in talking about these issues, but mostly from the perspective of ensuring that the public knows you know, exactly what we want to accomplish here, and that's to seek to get the truth. Uh, that's what we have been focused on at the beginning, and that's what we'll continue uh, to do. Some of these are questions that the, only the archives uh, could answer at this point. Um, I, I do think it's important to note that you know, we wouldn't have this um, except for the committee's uh, strong win in the Supreme Court to, to get these documents. Uh, the archives uh, undertook a, a robust effort uh, to catalog everything, but to work with us uh, to ensure that they're turning those documents over. Uh, and so that's uh, an important component here. Um, but uh, nobody, uh, what I can say is that it's not normal. Um, what the former president's spokesperson said, this is not a normal process of what he undertook. And he's been fighting us each and every step of the way, as have his congressional allies, uh, which uh, is important to note as well. Nothing about this is normal at all, to your point. Have you and your colleagues resigned yourself to the possibility that some truths may never come to light here? Well, we want to get to we want to get to all of the truth, and so that's why you know we dig a little bit deeper than just you know the call logs uh, that have been mentioned, and uh, you know we've actually shed light that, that the vice president, the former vice president, the former president spoke uh, the morning on January sixth. But you know, to your point, we want to know what those conversations were like. We want to know the substance, not just that they connected. Um, and so, in order to do that, uh, you're going to you know, you're going to need to hear from from interested parties. And so uh, that's an important component. And we just want to be able to tell the full and complete uh, story. But uh, we haven't given up yet. And, and we continue to make significant progress. Congressman, part of telling the full and complete story this week, a big focus on the committee's effort to reassemble the January 6th timeline. We know, as you said, that is a tall order, thanks to Trump's record-keeping practices, if you can call them that. I want to play something for you. A former member of his administration, Stephanie Grisham, describing the Trump phone situation at the White House. Take a listen. I don't know this for a fact, but knowing him the way that I do, I imagine people were coming in and saying, you know, so-and-so is on the phone, they want you to call it off, and he didn't want to. So if he didn't want to hear a message that somebody was saying, I'm sure he just didn't take the call. Um, he also would use staffers' phones sometimes, so that could be something that was happening. Somebody that was in the room with him could have handed him a phone if somebody was calling in that regard. I do think it's very odd, and, and I hope that they can look into it and maybe piece some things together, perhaps by getting other people's cell phone records. Congressman, he was using staffers' phones. We know the committee subpoenaed telecommunications companies for personal cell phone records. Can you tell us who those people are and whether or not you plan on specifically asking for Trump's personal cell phone records? Well, those are part of some of the investigative details that, that our team is, is working through. We've made no secret about this. In August uh, was the first uh, time that, that uh, we publicly indicated we were going to see the call data records. Uh, we were going to seek call data records uh, from individuals. And so uh, that's uh, an important investigative tool uh, for us. Um, but we haven't uh, detailed all of those. And we continue to work through that, that progress. Um, but it's, it's important. Um, but we're not closing any door at this point. Congressman, your committee this week subpoenaed former Trump aide Peter Navarro. He was on with our colleague Ari Malber yesterday. I want to play you something he said. Take a listen. Given that you've told me that you have a plan that you push to delay or deal with the certification, you've told me 100 members back it, and you've said in public Trump was on board. If you say all those things out here, why risk a legal battle or going to jail to refuse to discuss them with the committee under oath. It is what it is. I've been subpoenaed to that committee to testify and to turn over documents. The president has said, no, he's invoking executive privilege, not my privilege to waive, not going to cooperate with that committee until they negotiate um, a reasonable pathway with the president and his attorneys. Peter, no, no, no. no. Mr. Bannon was indicted uh, for this. Are you, are you prepared to risk indictment for defying the subpoena? I, I have loyalty to the Constitution and the president. 
Congressman Navarro put it in a book. He comes on cable news and shares it out loud with millions of viewers, yet he seems ready to defy your subpoena. We've seen this act before. You have seen this act before. Mark Meadows, Steve Bannon, Rudy Giuliani. Even if you do refer Navarro for contempt, are you confident in the Department of Justice to then take action? Well, we're going to let the Department of Justice work their work their own process, and but as they as they have shown, um, you know, they will deliver, and and that's exactly uh, what they sought to do, and and you know, we continue to await any decisions that they make related to to Mark Meadows, but clearly with Steve Bannon, um, you know, they they exercise their independence and they're moving forward. Uh, they've set a court date, um, you know, so these individuals who want to avoid us, um, you know, there should be consequences. Uh, these are lawful subpoenas uh, that we are sending over, and they have a story to tell. And some of them, clearly, uh, in Mr. Meadows' case, he sent us, te- you know, hundreds of text messages. Um, and in Mr. Navarro's case, he put this in the book, as did, you know, Mr. Meadows. So it's it's hard to imagine that they're claiming a privilege uh, that they don't hold, uh, and that neither does the former president hold that privilege. Only the current occupant holds that privilege. So uh, it's a little it's a little mind-boggling, but, uh, but nothing about what these cast of characters around the former president did is, uh, is, is normal. Congressman, if Peter Navarro is to be believed that cast of characters includes about 100 members of Congress who signed off on his plans. Are they going to be a subject of your investigation? Well, I I don't know if we can take Peter Navarro at his word there in in an interview uh, or or in a book. Um, What we know is more than 100 uh, of my colleagues voted not to certify a free and fair election. Uh, That's troubling in and of itself. Uh, but whether there was uh, broader coordination, you know, we don't we don't know that uh, at this point. And uh, and until Peter Navarro is willing to sit with us and talk with us exactly uh, how he came to that understanding, uh, it will be difficult. Um, so uh, we'll continue to work our investigative process uh, and make sure that we uh, uncover every rock. And that means uh, we have to engage in these individuals uh, and try to get them uh, to uh, to provide testimony to the committee.